about 20 years ago, I was invited to take a church weekend in the lovely Forest of Dee. It was a great weekend, and the subject that they gave me was the Book of Ruth. A few weeks after that, my phone rang, and it was my daughter, my eldest daughter, and she said, as all fathers know, Dad, and you're just wondering what's coming, and I wasn't expecting this, said, somebody just told me that we're in the Bible. And I said, really? And I said, well, you know that. She said, yes, I know. Her name is Sarah and wife of Abraham. I know that. She said, my surname, Perez. And I suddenly realized. I'd been reading and studying Ruth and a few times, and I hadn't got to the, I'd got to the end of the chapter, in chapter four, where the name Perez is there. And she married somebody of Spanish extraction and her name was Perez. And I said, do you know, I've never linked that up. I've read Ruth many times, but I've never linked your name to the book of Ruth. And then she said to me, the voice, Dad, it's what you're always saying. We always learn something new in the Bible. And that's true. And that's our prayer, that you may know the story of Ruth, but we want you to see something new and special. And we pray that the Holy Spirit would make it come alive and real and relevant to us. Because the New Testament writers uh, use Ruth as a picture, as a shadow, as they say. Now, you know about a shadow. Shadows are very useful. It can tell you whether it's a human being or an animal. Particularly in Africa, it can be very helpful to know whether it's a lion or is it a person. But it doesn't give us the details. You can see it's a person, but you can't see the color of their eyes and what it's like. And so too with the picture of Ruth and Boaz, particularly of Boaz. It's a picture of the Lord Jesus. But it doesn't give us all the details, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But another lesson in the book of Ruth, which we were thinking about, is it's about a minority family. And as we were reminded, that we are just less than 4% of the population interested <coughs> and prepared to be in church this morning. And so it's relevant to us. And this minority family who's worshipping God, decided to leave Bethlehem where they were, where they were given their land and inheritance and everything, and go down to Moab. And the problem was, this was a godly family. And at Christmas time, we'll be reading the book of Micah, the prophet. We'll be looking at chapter 5 and verse 2. You'll know it immediately. Out of you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, will come a ruler, a saviour. And God had always planned that out of Bethlehem would come Jesus. And he would be born in Bethlehem. <laughs> and come from a family such as Elimelech. They were prime people, godly people. They were ideal for God to use. But now they go and live in Moab. And it raises the question, does it throw God's plans off? What's happening? Can we mess up God's plans? There's a verse in the book of Proverbs. Ruth's great-great-grandson wrote this verse. In chapter 19 and verse 21. And it says this. Many are the plans in a man's heart. But it's God's will that will prevail. You and I have many ideas and many plans. We plan to go for an appointment and then we suddenly get stuck on the motorway. We can't go backwards or forwards. We miss the appointment. You can't regain the time. That's it. Our plans are affected. But God's plans, because he is eternal, he's the God of time and space, can never be put off course. 
and God here was going to use Bethlehem to produce the Messiah. And so in the heart of Naomi, after making that disastrous decision to go down to Moab, they lose the family, they lose Elimelech, they lose the two sons, Mal and Chilia, and she decides to go back and let God have her. She comes back with nothing. And she comes back, why? Because they went down to Moab because they didn't have food in Bethlehem. Well, of course, they'd heard that God had blessed Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread, was there. There was plenty of food, so they came back and they could start gleaning. That principle laid down that farmers wouldn't plow up and uh, reap at the edge of the field. They'd always leave something for the poor. God's heart for the poor was that it would be there. There was no gleaning in Moab. Moab is a land, when you read it in the Bible, it's full of people of flesh and interested in only in self, self-preservation. Yes, Ruth could have worked there. There was no gleaning. She could have worked for a pittance getting uh, food. But she came back to where God, I'm trusting in God. And there she went out. And her chance, as it would seem, but a sovereign God was in control. She just happens, just happens to go to Boaz's field. And as we saw last week, Boaz saw her and his heart was smitten. It was love at first sight. And he looked at her, he whined and dined her at lunchtime. He gave her the thing and went back to there, to Naomi with a huge amount. And Naomi came and realized what was going on. She wouldn't have got that much grain simply by gleaning. No. It was given to her by Boaz. And Naomi does, thinks this through. And she begins to plot. And that's why we commented on that the Jewish community read this at the time of Pentecost. And one of the things they get out of it is the fact that they have matchmakers whereby they arrange marriages. And a lot of them think about Naomi when they do that today. And just as an aside, I found out recently they've moved with the times and they've now not only linked personal matchmaking in the Jewish community, but they've got a website. And it's called, wait for it, I saw you at Sinai. <laughs> so they use that, and they still arrange marriages. And that's why this chapter seems very strange to us. For most of us to think that an arranged marriage this is the time of Judges, and of course in the book of Judges, Samson, the big strong man, actually went to his mum and dad and said, Mum, Dad, would you get me a wife? I can't think of many of my friends who would have done that. But that's the culture at the time. So that fits very much in the culture. And so Naomi plots and says, listen, you've got to take the initiative. Wasn't that Boaz was slow? She said, you've got to take the initiative. And I want you to go to see Boaz. And I want you to put your best clothes on. It's most probably that she was dressed up in widow's clothes. That's why Boaz said to her, look, I'm going to look after you. Because she would have been fair game for a salt. A widow, a stranger in Bethlehem. In Israel. She was a Moabite then. And she would have been fair game. So she puts on her best clothes. She'd been to Jerusalem, I suspect, and maybe got her uh, Yves Saint Laurent or whatever it was, and put it all on, and she smelled beautifully. She was dressing up as a bride because that was her mission. And Naomi said, You go and you lay at Boaz's feet. Well, you watch it. It's the time of the um, 
sorting out the wheat from the chaff, you know, where they would throw it up and let the, ch the wind blow the chaff away and have the barley there ready to use. He's going to supervise that. He's not going to let anyone else go because they would steal it. And it's party time. It's harvest Thanksgiving. They're going to have a great time. And he most probably will have had one too many. But he'll sleep there. And you watch him. So she turns up. She saw Boaz. And she saw Boaz go to sleep. And when he was asleep, she did what Naomi suggested. She, he uncovered, she uncovered his feet. Now for a lot of us, if we have cold feet, particularly outside, we don't sleep too well. And she uncovered his feet, and he woke up. So what was the reason for uncovering his feet? Ah, there was more to it than just to wake him up. You see, if I'm walking down the road with my two of my grandsons, and one of them said, Grandpa, look, there's a soldier there. How does he know he's a soldier? Well, he's got a uniform, hasn't he? And the other one said, Grandpa, he's a sergeant. How does he know he's a sergeant? He's got three stripes. And in our society, we know somebody's status by the uniform and by the stripes that they have. Whereas in Jewish society, in the time of Ruth, it was very different. It was the garment and the hem of the garment that displayed a person's status. The high priest in the temple had a lot of pomegranates and things around there which demonstrated that he was a high priest and it showed his status in fact one day in the um, book of Ruth, uh, uh, in the book of Luke, we are told that Jesus was in a crowd and a lady who had an issue of blood came to him in Luke 7 and she couldn't get to Jesus. So she went forward and she touched the hem of his garment. Why? Because she knew that that was, <coughs> although it was a simple plain garment, that's where the symbol of authority and power of the day. And Jesus said, who's touched me? And the disciples said, that's crazy. Listen, the crowd's pressed around you, you don't know. No. Somebody's touched me because they know that I need they need healing. And so uncovering his feet was to demonstrate not only to wake him up, but that she had something to do with his position and status. And she was interested in being redeemed. You see, she'd lost everything. She and Naomi had lost a husband, lost all their possessions. They had nothing. And that was very important in Israel. In fact, it was, it's in, it was important historically here in having a line of succession, um, particularly in royalty. It's only recently that they changed that. Very important. Because when Israel came out of Egypt, God said to them, you are slaves but I'm freeing you and I'm going to give you land that you can grow and look after yourself and that is land is your possession it's your inheritance and through your family and God instituted a system whereby if they lost the land after 50 years they would get it back the year of Jubilee to restore it so there was nobody in slavery again but 50 years is a long time a lifetime for most of us. And so God introduced another scheme called the Leverite Marriage and the Kinsman Redeemer. In other words, if somebody in your family had enough money, they could buy back the land that you'd sold because you couldn't afford to keep it up because you'd had a bad time, you'd sold, the crops weren't good, all sorts of reasons. 
they could do that. But also, along with that, was the Leverite marriage. Now, you Latin scholars will recognize Leverite. It's from the Latin, which means brother-in-law. And the brother-in-law could actually do that work, but not only that, if the husband had died, he could marry the widow so that they could have children and the inheritance would carry on. And so when Ruth comes, she says, hey, would you be my redeemer? And Boaz wakes up in the middle of the night. He's had a few to drink. What was his reaction? Wow. Am I dreaming? The woman of my dreams is at my feet. Who are you? He didn't know. You know what it's like if you suddenly wake up in the middle of the night. You often know where you are. That's how Boaz was. He says, oh, is it? And she said, it's Ruth here. You are my kinsman redeemer. Would you redeem me? Would you sort out my problem? He said, wonderful. He couldn't believe it. You have done the best thing for me. He'd obviously been dreaming about her, thinking about her, and now she was asking him to sort out the situation, to marry her. And he said, I will do it. But you go back to your mother-in-law. But don't go back empty-handed. He said, where's your shawl? gave her a shawl and she filled it with barley, put it on her head and went back <coughs> with an enormous amount. But she, he said, go in the morning, make sure nobody sees you because they don't want you to think you're a loose woman living here. That's not you. You don't want them at all. Just go back and go back. But he said, there's a problem. Tell Naomi everything, but there's a problem. I would love to redeem you. I would love to sort it all out. But there's a kinsman, a man who is nearer than you. He said, tomorrow I'll go to the gate of the city where all the legal transactions are taking place and we'll look at that next week. But he said, at the moment, he said, there's a nearer kinsman. You'll have to wait. And you know, for us, for Jesus to save us, there is a nearer kinsman. You see, when you and I were born, we were born to die. The death sentence is all of us from birth. That's a fact of life. When God made man, in the beginning, he made him to enjoy communion and fellowship. And he came down and talked with Adam and Eve. And they enjoyed eternal life. But sin came in. And with sin, death. And death. And the law of God says that because we're sinners, we have to die. And that's the claim on our life. But Jesus wants to be our redeemer. He wants to save us. He wants to restore that which we originally had. Eternal life. And he came to pay the price because he's wealthy. He died for us that we might live. And that we might have eternal life with him. But not only a tomb of life, or more than that. Because, as we'll see later, Boaz restored to Ruth, not only that, but a future inheritance. And when you come to Jesus, and when we come to Jesus, we have a guaranteed future inheritance. Eternal life. Guaranteed. Because Jesus is our Boaz. Jesus is our Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the glorious fact that although we were born 
and shapen in sin, uh, that was us. We thank you that there is hope. We thank you that Jesus came as our kinsman. He took on flesh, he lived amongst us, and yet died at the cross of Calvary for us. To set us free, to grant us eternal life. And Lord, as we have sung about it, we can boldly approach the eternal throne and claim that we have eternal life because Jesus is our Redeemer. Lord, as we think about these things, impress them upon on our heart and help us to be a praising people and realize what we have in you as we give you thanks. Lord, speak to us by your Spirit that we might worship you as the true and eternal God, our Saviour. Amen.